been through some mountains, have you? And for that, we give God praise. We don't fall over and complain. We give God praise for every mountain that he's brought us over. Amen. Amen. RBC, it's a privilege. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. And I want to thank Luan for his introduction. I do have to clarify one thing. And I'm glad I have some witnesses. I was not calling him asking to go to his basketball games, okay? No, 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 no. It was a group of my friends, and they're here today, Nicole, Kawana, and Janelle. They were calling us because they didn't have any groupies. We weren't groupies, but they had nobody to go support them at these games. They didn't have a church to support them, so they would call us and ask us to go. So that's why I was there. The bonus was Dan. <laughs> But I want to read the scripture one more time. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. The title of my message this morning is Deadly Leadership. Can we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to worship together with you. I pray that the message that you've given me to share will have a serious impact upon the hearts of your children. All of you, none of me, all of you, none of me. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 The year is 1911, and there are two groups of explorers who are about to embark on the most incredible journey, the journey to the South Pole. During this time in the Earth's history, no one had dared ventured out to the South Pole. In recent years, someone had made it to the North Pole, but no one had went to the South Pole. So now the race was on to see who would get the bragging rights, who would be the first one to get there. Our first team of explorers was led out by Raoul Unmanson from Norway. The second team was led out by Robert Falcon Scott from Britain. Now Raoul Unmanson was a great planner. When he thought about this trip, even thinking about it for a while, he began to plan and prepare to make sure that his journey was a success. Knowing that the South Pole is cold, he did the only thing that made sense. He began to study the people of the Arctic and the Eskimos. And based upon his research and his studies, he determined that the best mode of transportation that they should use would be sleds. sleds pulled by dogs. So he did more research and he found that North Greenland sled dogs were the best, the strongest, and the most capable dogs to make this journey. So he ordered 100 from North Greenland. He also determined that it's not wise for us to carry all of our supplies along this journey. So he located supply depots where he would stock them with food and supplies that they would need. And he made certain that each depot was just the right distance apart. And finally, he made sure that they were marked, properly marked, so that, that while they're journeying, they could see each depot. Now, as they thought about this journey, he said, okay, it's cold. I've got to make sure that our clothes are adequate. So again, he went to the Eskimos. He purchased seal skin suits for each member that was going on this journey with him. And on top of those seal skin suits, they had to have warm coats. So the coats that he made were coats fashioned after the Eskimos again. And these coats were made of reindeer skin, wolf skin, and Burberry. He wanted to make sure that his team was OK. And then he thought about their feet. He couldn't take a chance of them getting frostbite along the journey. So he said, OK, what type of boots could I get? And he couldn't find any. So he designed some. 
boots that would endure the rugged terrain and the frigid temperatures. And it took him two years to develop these boots. He said, okay. The Arctic, you know, as you're traveling along, there's dips and there's crevices. So ordinary skis, they won't do. So he developed skis that were wider and then were longer than your average ski so that they could easily go over crevices. Raoul Unmanson was a great planner. And then he said, okay, who should I take on this journey with me? Well, it was easy. He had dogs, so he got expert dog handlers. They were going to be skiing, so he got expert skiers. Like I said, he was a great planner. Now, Robert Falcon Scott, he too was a planner, but he planned a little differently. When he, got the, when he thought about the mode of transportation that they should use, his team, he determined that, hmm, motorized sleds would be better. And let's take with us some ponies. But only five days in the journey, he discovered that this was the wrong move because the motors on the sled stopped working. So now, who was gonna pull the sleds? The men and the ponies. Now mind you, there were only five men in his group. And then when they got to the base of the Transarctic Mountains, something else terrible happened. They realized the ponies were the wrong animals for this journey. They weren't strong enough to handle the weather and the terrain. So they had to put these ponies to sleep. No motors, no ponies, sleds, and equipment. Five men. The men journeyed on. And there was another problem. As they continued to journey, the men started to get a little hungry. Because again, Robert Falcon Scott didn't really think things through the way he should have. At the very last minute, he added a fifth man on, but he didn't add enough food for the fifth man. Nor, when he thought about stocking the depots, he thought about it, but he didn't adequately stock them, nor did he make sure that they were spaced out the right amount of distance, nor did he mark them so that they could see where they were. So the men were suffering from hunger. They were thirsty too. <laughs> Dehydration began to set in because again, Robert Falcon Scott dropped the ball. They didn't bring enough fuel to power the motor that they used to melt the snow to give them water to drink. And, and the clothes, that was an issue too. He picked out warm clothes, but he didn't do research like Raoul Unmanson. He just didn't do it. Every single man on the trip developed frostbite. So they're hurting. And as they're traveling, the goggles that he chose for them were the wrong goggles. They developed snow blindness. They couldn't even see where they were going. This was a terrible situation. But they journeyed on. And as they journeyed, they finally, after 10 weeks of travel, and 800 miles, made it to the South Pole. It was a hard journey, but they made it there. One of the men, he made it, but his frostbite turned into gangrene. And it took him an hour to take off his boot and an hour to put it back on. But they made it. And when they got there, they saw the Norwegian flag flapping in the wind with a letter from Raoul Udmanson, which let them know that he had beat them by over a month, over a month. But unfortunately, that's not where the story ends. Robert Falcon Scott had the bright idea that, well, we're here at the South Pole, so let's start, we gotta take some geological specimens back with us. So he collected 30 pounds. Now, the men did not agree with this. They were already weary. They had no ponies or no motorized sleds to help them carry this stuff back, but he insisted, and he was their leader. So. They carried back these specimens. And along the journey, one of the five men fell into a stupor and died. Four men continued journeying on. Then the man who had frostbite that had turned into gangrene and had trouble putting on his boots, his situation was getting worse, and he knew it. So one day when they're sitting in their tent, there's a blizzard going on outside, and he realizes, I, I can't make this journey. So he says, you know what, guys? I'm going to step outside for a minute. Don't, don't, don't worry. I'll be a little while. 
and he walks outside into the blizzard to his death. Two men down, three left on this journey home. Then finally, after eight weeks of traveling with only 150 miles left to go, the remaining three men sit down and they begin to write in their journals. They write the story of their trip and Robert Falcon Scott's journal ends, we shall die like men. And they died. What a tragic story of failed leadership. Here you had two groups of people, two groups of explorers, led by two different men who had the same good intentions, the same goals, the same aspirations to make it to the South Pole. Neither one thought that death was an option, but the results of their journeys were so different. RPC, who in this building intends to go on a journey that leads to death? Nobody. So I can safely assume that each and every one of us here desires to go on a journey that ends in eternal life, right? Right, that's our intention. But good intentions aren't enough. Good intentions are not enough. See, the devil doesn't care about good intentions. Actually, he likes them. Because when you have good intentions, you feel good. And he, he doesn't care if you feel good. He just cares if you don't do what's necessary to make those good intentions a reality. Now, I've heard this statement. My father, they told him it in the military. They said it to me when I went to med school, and you might have heard it too. When you start your program, they say, look to your left, look to your right. One of you's not gonna make it. And you're like, wow, that's encouraging. Thank, thank you for telling me that. And you know, when they told us that in school, it's, it's a very, it, it kind of gets you shook, like, whoa. Really? But I find it interesting because Jesus told his students the same thing. He said, broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in it. But narrow and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life, and few there be that go in it. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, RPC, look to your left, Look to your right. The majority, not because the odds are against you, but by your choice, are going to choose the wide road that leads to destruction. Good intentions are never enough. Good intentions need preparation and proper planning to back them, to amount to anything. That's what's required. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, Outliers, The Story of Success. Okay, and, and basically in this book, Malcolm Gladwell is just, you know, trying to define what is it that makes somebody successful. But in the book, he studied one particular study that was done in the early 1990s by psychologists in Berlin, Germany. And these psychologists wanted to know, why is it that certain violinists are so much better than others? And we're not talking about just random. They went to, we're talking about the best violin players. And it's not an issue of talent. They weren't concerned about talent. They wanted to know what makes them different. So they did this study. And they asked a vast group of violin players one question. From the time you picked up the violin for your entire career, how many hours did you put in to practice? Okay, so this is what they found. At the age of five, the hours were all the same. Everybody had put in the same amount of effort. By the time the children turned eight, the practice hours began to kind of diverge. And by the age of 20, there was a clear separation between the elite and just your average violin players. And what they found was that across the board, the elite had put 10,000 hours of practice, preparation into their craft. While everybody else, about 4,000 hours. So Gladwell found this study to be interesting and he continued to study. And he discovered that this was true across the board. It wasn't just for violin 
players, any field. Athletes, it's obvious. We know Michael Jordan was not born shooting the basketball. It was the effort that he put into it. So when you think about this study, I know what I thought. I said, wow, it's interesting. It's not about talent. It's not about your natural ability. It's about the effort, the time, the practice, the preparation that you put into it. So what if we as Christians did something crazy like apply the 10,000 hour rule to our salvation? Could we then stand amongst the spiritual elite? Is it possible? Of course it is. Of course it is. Could we be numbered amongst those in the hall of faith? By faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Devon. By faith, Nadesh. By faith, Keaton. By faith, every person in this room. And wouldn't it be nice once our journey is ended and we get to heaven and Jesus comes to us and he says, you know what, with the good book, I think I need to rewrite Hebrews 11 because your name needs to be in there. Preparation. It all comes down to preparation, not good intentions, preparation. Now, as we all know, recently, Steph Curry and Golden State Warriors, they proved themselves to be the NBA's elite, right? Now, what if in the preparation time, preseason, every week they went to a lecture, a lecture on the theory of basketball, where you have them learning about different plays, different defenses, you know, all these things that can really get them on their game with their basketball knowledge. And they faithfully go to this lecture every single week, and they learn, they listen but not one time did they pick up a basketball and practice or apply what they learned during the week. Do you think they would be successful? No. No. That really sounds absurd to me, but we as Christians take that approach to our spiritual lives. We come to our lecture every Sabbath for two hours, and we sit and we listen, but during the week, what are we doing? Where's the preparation? Salvation is not earned by osmosis, just hearing a good word, hearing what it is we should do, hearing the techniques and the things that we should apply, hearing how we should treat people. It's by practicing those things during the week and living a life that's pleasing to God, preparation. Now, like Luan said, um, I, I consider myself a serial student. I've been in too many schools, and I have no desire to ever go back. I'm done. I'm done. But in school, I consider myself a successful student, not because I was a born genius. No, I had to work harder, probably harder than most. But I understood the concept of the 10,000 hour rule. I just put in the hours. I put the hours in. I put the hours in. I put the hours in, and I reaped the rewards of my preparation. Now, when I left Oakwood and went to Howard, I realized preparation ain't enough. I need something else. It, it, quickly, I understood. I needed to put in more hours, 10,000, 20,000, whatever. A sister was struggling. It was the sheer amount of information that was given to me that made me realize I needed help. And so one day, I was coming up on a microbiology exam. And this micro exam was the make it, break it exam. If I did not pass this exam, I was going to have to repeat this course. And so I put in hours and hours and hours. And for those of you who know me, I have a sleep disorder. So it was even more hard to put those hours in and stay awake, but I, I sacrificed everything. I put those hours in. And then finally, I said, you know what, Simone, you, you need help. So I go to the, the professor. His name is Dr. Mazami. I said, Dr. Mazami, I need help. And he was a kind professor, and he said, you know what, Simone, I'm going to help you. He was my friend. He said, I'm going to help you. Come office hours. This is the day before the exam, and I'm going to help you. So I went, and Dr. Mazami sat down with me, and we went over everything. He went over all the concepts, everything that was possibly going to be on this exam. Then when office hours were ended, the man still stayed. We were in his office for hours because he realized, and I knew, I needed help. So now here comes the day of the exam, the morning of the exam. And the way we took our exams is all the students sat in the auditorium, and the, the doctors and all the professors stood up front like the guard dogs, and they just kind of paced the room 
while you're taking your exam. So when I walk into the room, there's Dr. Mazam, and he's looking at me like, you got this, Simona. We put in the work. You're going to do this. And I was like, ha-ha. I got my exam, and I went and sat down. And the first thing I do, I bow down my head. I said, Lord, help me. We've got this. And the way I take exams, I always kind of scan through them first to see what it is so I can get a strategy of how to take the exam. I look at page one. I'm like, mm-hmm. Page two. Page three. Page four. Okay. Finally, I looked at page five. I put the test down. I looked at Dr. Mazami. I looked at the test. And I said another prayer. I said, Lord, please prepare me for summer school. Please prepare me. And y'all, I, I literally, I failed the exam. And I remember sitting there thinking, but Dr. Mazami's going to think I'm a fool. The man done told me basically everything that's going to be on the exam, and yet and still, I failed. It's something that I, I literally don't, un I don't understand it. To this day, it's like, it's a mystery. How does that happen? And I'm not a dummy. I'm not an idiot, you guys. I, I really, I put the time in. I went to the person, and, and get this, the man who wrote the test, knew every question, every answer, every solution, and I failed. But that's okay, because what I do know is this, that when it comes to the journey of your life and the test of your life, when you put in the hours and you go to the one who knows every trial you're going to face, he knows every question that's coming along your journey, and he has a solution, he has detours, he has Every solution to everything that you're going to face, you are guaranteed to win. Period. Period. God says, Simona, you went to Dr. Mazami. Dr. Mazami is a man. He does not have the power to go into your mind and transform your mind. He can't do that. But I can do that for you when you are trying to travel down life's journey. It's a guarantee. It's a no-brainer. But God says, put in the work. Put in the work. God can't force us to do anything, but he is an ever-present help for those who try. For those who try. Now, putting in the work and doing these things often, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. It, it requires sacrifice. A lot of times, a sacrifice that we, won't, we don't want to make. But you have to do it. And each of us, whether we know it or not, we are leaders. And we have a responsibility because leadership is simply influence. And if you have the ability to influence anybody, you are a leader, okay? And God says, I want you to lead people to my kingdom. Lead them to the narrow path. That's, that's what our job here is Christian, as Christians is. And as parents, you're automatic leaders, right? Automatically, because little people cannot lead themselves. They're depending on you. So we have an awesome responsibility. Now, in my life, as a parent, my leadership for my children requires sacrifice. And everybody has to sacrifice. I don't know what it is, but all of us, to stay on the narrow road, it requires sacrifice. Now, for me, I made a commitment. I said, God, when I prayed about having kids and I begged and pleaded with God and God said yes, I said, God, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure my children make it into your kingdom. That was my prayer and my commitment to God. And I realized, based on research and based on what Sister White said, you know, the, the research just catches up. God been done said the stuff. Six and seven. Up until six and seven, if you can really instill values into a child in, by six and seven, they're gold. You know, they, they can grow up and they can go a little haywire, but the reality is, Nine times out of 10, they're coming back. Okay, that's the solid foundation is six and seven. And so with my career, I was working at a, a law firm. And it became very clear to me that, no, 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 this, this law firm is clashing with my priorities. And this, this wasn't a guess. This is what the man told me. He called me into a meeting one day. And he said, Simona, mind you, the meeting was called because I took one vacation day. I had three weeks vacation. Took a vacation day to go on an anniversary trip with my husband. And this man had the nerve to call me in for a meeting. He said, Simona, you, you don't understand the culture of this firm. We have a reputation. 
we are number one priority. Your family comes second. That's what he said. And he kept talking, and I didn't hear another word he said because I was like, I am out of here. I'm not staying here. You sound crazy. But that was the culture of that firm. And because I had made a commitment to God and myself, that was going to clash with what I was trying to do. So I left the job. Left all that good money. <laughs> I left the good money, and I, and I stayed home and raised my children. And the benefit, you know, I saw the benefits. You know, you, you do things, and you do things that God wants you to do. Everybody has their own journey. But for me, it was staying home with my kids. You, you see the benefits. When you go to the store and people say, wow, your kids are well-behaved. Or, you know, you just see the benefits. Because I was putting in the time. I was putting in hours. The sacrifice hurt. It hurt. I went through a lot of school. I went through a lot of school so I could have a lot of money. Money's gone. Money's gone. And, and God was not... Supplying the money, he just was. I mean, the needs were supplied, but he was not providing extra money. So it was a sacrifice, but the sacrifice is always worth it. Now, I had committed to myself that I was going to do it for six to seven years. Then one day, the, it, the pressure of the sacrifice seemed a bit too hard, and I said, you know what, I need to go get a job. I need to go back. Let me, and so I researched. I said, you know, if I'm going back, I'm going to go to a firm that I like. So I found one firm that I believe that fit what would work out for me. And let me tell you, in my heart, my friends know, I, it wasn't in me to go back, but I was doing it because I felt like, you know, I, I need to because I need money. So I had this interview, and I'm, we're having this discussion, and I'm just going to let you know, at this point in my life, I'm older. I, when I have an interview, I'm not playing games. I'm not going to say things just to impress you. I'm going to tell you the truth, because if the job is for me, it's for me. And so we're talking, the interview's going well, and then the man asked me a question. He asked me a question that gave me cause to pause. And he and I both knew I wasn't ready to go back to work. I wasn't ready. And after that interview, I remember I literally, I laid on my bed and I cried. I cried, I was like, Lord, this is tough. Yes, I, I see the benefits of what's happening with my, yes. But what about the money? What about it? You know, what about it? And I cried and I cried and I was very, very sad by my reality because it wasn't like I couldn't go back to work. It was a choice I had to make and the choice I was making caused me a little pain. When you're preparing for life's journey, sometimes the sacrifice is hard. And let me tell you the question the man asked me. January 17, 2014. January 17, 2014. That man said, Simona, what would you do if one of your children got sick? He just asked me that. I don't know why the man asked me that. He just, he doesn't know why he asked me that. But I knew what the answer was. I don't care about a job. I care about my kids. February 16, 2014, almost a month to the day that he asked me that question, mommy, my head hurts. Who in the world would have thought? When he asked me that question, I didn't think it. I just knew what I would do if one of my kids got sick. But who would have thought that a month later that question was going to become a reality for me? And most of you know the story. My head hurt turned into brain cancer that eventually took the life of my son in five short months. And when I think about preparation, yes, it's sacrifice. But time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. Because let me tell you, when you are sitting there with your child, watching them breathe their last breaths, you can care less about a lot of stuff that bothers you here in this world. You can care less. I didn't give a, I didn't care. <laughs> you know? I, I didn't. All of a sudden, everything that's cloudy, that the devil tries to use to cloud your vision, gets clear. I didn't care about money. 
I didn't care about my career that I was so sad about that had been put on pause because of the sacrifice. I didn't care about anything. The only thing I cared about and the only question that mattered was what path had I led this child down? That, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. When your time is up, the only thing that matters is what path are you on? That's it. And I can thank God. I can thank God. I thank God. And that's the reason I can, can, can praise him and rejoice that he gave me enough common sense that when Braden was born, that I took his little hand and I led him step by step along the narrow path. Gu guaranteed. I know it. And the thing about it is, Braden didn't have a choice. He was a child depending upon his parents to lead him. And I know that I know that I know that I led that child down the narrow path. Here's the thing. When any of us come into this world, we're not given a fact sheet. We don't know. God doesn't say, okay, you're born today and your journey is going to end on XYZ. You don't know. You don't know. The events of this week let you know. You don't know. We're sitting in church right now. We don't know. And because you don't know, you have got to live your life as if time is of the essence. You got to do it. You got to do it. Braden had five years. Five years. And it's okay because it doesn't matter when your journey ends. It just matters what path it ends on. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. If you're on the narrow path, you're good. Five years, five days, 50 years. It does not matter because eternity trumps all this crap. It does. I led him down the straight and narrow. But the question is this. Now, there's no this concept of once saved, always saved, once on the narrow path, always on the narrow path. No, it doesn't happen like that. That's why God says the majority of people are on the broad, they, they're just doing your thing on the broad path. So God says, Simona, where are you now leading yourself? You got to lead yourself on the narrow path. Don't fall off. Simona, what about Savannah? How many years does she have? I don't know. But each and every day I have to lead her down the narrow path. Simona, what about Van? Is how you're living your life a positive influence on him? Or is it an influence that will cause him to fall off the path? Every day, every second counts. And that's what God's saying to you. RPC, what path are you on right now? Think about it. What path are you on right now? And again, let's throw good intentions out the door. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Yeah, we know that. Everybody ain't going to heaven. Think about your life. Think about the preparation, the hours that you're putting in. Are you doing what it takes to stand amongst the spiritual elite? Let me tell you, God wants you to. God says, I have everything that you need, all the talent, everything. I just want to pour it down on you, but you have to get on the path and prepare. Robert Falcon Scott's story is a tragic story. It's, it's sad. This man had the best of intentions. But because he didn't prepare, his life ended prematurely in a way that he could have never imagined. What path are you on? How are you leading yourself? And how are you leading others? I want to read to you. James 4:14. 4, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It vanisheth away. But when your vapor vanishes, I ask you this question again. Is it going to vanish on the broad path? Or will it vanish on the narrow path? which really means your life is just beginning. It's just beginning because eternity is in store for you. Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life. Get on the narrow path.